Who here has ever been in Kilkashin graveyard? Five people? It's very hard to get to. And uh, John and JJ have been asking me for years to give a talk about it. And because there have been negotiations going on about trying to establish access and clean it up, and they were slightly commercially sensitive, I didn't want to do it. But at this stage, um, they've gone on for so long that I hope anything I say won't uh, prejudice what we're doing. I put together a few notes. They're on my website. Those of you who are technically minded and want to look at them later can go to pwalden.info forward slash kilkashin. So by way of introduction, it works. Uh, there was a group set up, uh, John Lynch is down there, who is the chairperson called Korja Kilkashin, the Friends of Kilkashin Graveyard. And John informed me that before I came on board for a number of years, he was the only member of the group. But our plans are to acquire and fence in the burial ground and to provide car parking and pedestrian access off the main Kilkee to Carrigaholt Road and to erect a memorial to all those buried in unmarked plots there. It was used for centuries as a killeen, burial ground for unbaptized children, etc. Was used as recently as 1953 as a graveyard for adults, but not very much. And generally just used by the people in the few townlands around Frore Upper and Lower, Movine East and West, Lachine Crona and Lachine Frore. So to show you what it looks like, I'm going to start with a little video. I hope you'll be able to hear this. You'll have to be deathly quiet because the sound out of the television is not that loud. And this was broadcast on Newark TG Cahar the 7th of February 2018. And it stars John Lynch, who's here in the front row, and Asamta Concanon, who we all miss very dearly, especially her husband, Jar, who's down the back. So let's hope this works. <laughs> is <laughs> You could never come into this grave because of the cattle. There was always cattle and bulls. So as could you lady could achieve, could have played it all night and saw in the mask and team there as some to come cannon. I thought I'd pushed in the relegation. The naked sphere, more than a bed and day. I was a screen of my hair raw, long. Gorman, she trusted in a park with her. Good deal on relic. I was in the corner in an hour ago. but then for that we will have our pathway in and the plan will uh, uh, get mass celebrated here 
we give a proper burial to the family people, we will baptize the children that were buried here that wasn't baptized. Pasul and Talabu by Kanahe, Agassan Kosan of Oscar to be here in the Viana Sau. On the Scubiat of Dina Tatishak and Du, Agas Nadian for Daru the Rasun, a talk and gold and so. Tomorrow, so many, no TGK, a relative Hashi, and a Hinch down there. Tasul Gum Guel Guel Galip got Kenya and Shah. Did you all understand that? Bits of, bits of it were in English. So I'm, I'm glad, John, that for those who are here who don't have Irish, that you translate it for them. Um, so we'll come back to some of the things that were said in the video as we go on, but hopefully that's given you an idea of where it is at the back of Mobian School. I'm sure everyone here knows the road out to carry the hold and knows the school on the right-hand side. Um, we we'll look at some of the Irish versions of the name. There it is on the map on loganum.ie. That's the main Kilkee to carry the whole road. And the townland of Kilkasheen stretches from the upper Movine Road down below the lower Movine Road down towards the Lachine Bog area. And we have a long list here of historical references from 1608 all the way up to 1965 all of which describe it as Kilkasheen, one with a K, Kilkaskin, but generally fairly obvious spelling variants of how we spell it today. And it confirms it was a deserted burying place in the year 1739, but has continued ever since to be a burial place, though not a popular one. That's from the Ordnance Survey letters. Here is a very poor map from the Ask About Ireland website showing the farms in Kilkasheen in 1855. And that little grey bit across there says Kilkasheen Graveyard. And that number three there says it was farm number three in the townland in 1855. And we have here a list of the occupiers of Kilkasheen in 1855. There were nine pieces of land, uh, six with houses, one with a caretaker's house. Michael O'Donnell seems to have been a middleman working for John Westrop, the landlord. And he rented 53 acres, which he occupied himself with his caretaker's house. And then he sublet as middleman the rest of the townland to a number of other tenants. And Timothy Kane was the tenant at the time on whose land the graveyard was. But shortly after that, um, this is a slightly later map. All those numbers that you saw on the black and white map were struck out and Michael O'Donnell took over most of the townland, plot number one. So there's Kilkasheen graveyard a little more clearly illustrated. There's no school in Kilkasheen. There's no school in Movine. That map was drawn in 1840 in black and white. The red bit was added to it sometime around the early 1860s, probably with the new farm boundaries. Um, and here is a later map from about 1900. Um, this is on our Facebook page, which I set up a number of years ago. Now it shows the boundaries of the graveyard, which is just a small little area within a field of almost three acres, 2.986 acres. This building down here is the first Movine school. It opened in 1852, and it wasn't in Movine, it was in Kilkasheen. This dotted line is the boundary between Movin East on the left and Kilkasheen on the east. The present Movin School, as you'll know if you look up when you drive past, was built in 1890. I think the first pupils moved in early in 1891. This building over here then became a teacher's house. And it's now just a derelict foundation, bushes grown over it. That was part of our problem as to how we're going to get in from the main road to the graveyard. Can we go up that side of the derelict house? Who owns the derelict school? But now we're going to go up around the outside of that and up by the ditch to the graveyard. Um, Kilkasheen is a small townland, 189 acres. By the 1901 census, there were just four households, Collinses, Tuberties, Hickeys, and Downses. And the Tuberty family... Um, had by this stage come from Myasta. You may know a large two-story house on the north side of the road, um, just on this side of Myasta, which is now in ruins. That was the original Tuberty home. And there was a family of about 10 Tuberties grew up in that house. And several of them by 1901 
had come to live in Kilkashin townland, Patrick and John and Nora. And Patrick married shortly afterwards to Margaret Queeley from Lachin. And he had a family of five children who grew up. And that house is now in ruins. As you drive back to Carrigahold, you hopefully can still see the ruin of the house of, of, of that horizon. It's probably going to fall down before too long. The other family is Cornelius Hickey had been a teacher in the original Moveen school by 1901. He was retired. Um, his son was the famous Dr. P.C. Hickey, who was the doctor in Kilrush for, men, in Kilkee for many years. And in the census, actually, his grandson, uh, Julian Hickey, is in the household. Sorry, I hit the wrong button there. Um, should have gone back up to this one. Um, those links will bring you to my genealogy website. Those of you who don't use it, it'll ask you to register and log in. So make sure you tell me who you are if you follow these links and want to use it. Um, Julian V. Hickey, grandson, age 10, was the doctor's son living with his grandparents. And they were originally from Limerick or Tipperary. And other sources it says Tipperary, but in the census it says Cornelius was born in Limerick and they're pension teachers. And then in the following, the other house, the Downs house, that's another teacher. I'm not sure that he taught in Moveen. At different times, he taught in Kilkee and Kilvira at Thomas Downs. I'm not sure, is there anyone living in Kilkashin townland nowadays? Or all these families are gone. Is there any actual inhabited house in the townland? Not sure. I meant to look at the map and, and, and try and figure that out. Anyway, um, the Tuberty family had a troubled existence, I suppose, because the story is that the lease from the O'Donnells to the Tuberties had some convoluted clauses in it. Um, and it was even suggested to me that nobody would ever marry one of the Tuberties because whatever right they had to the land, the lease wasn't solid enough to make it worthwhile as, as, as a dowry. So as it turned out, none of the five children ever married. And some of you may even remember Mary Tubb, as we used to call her, Mary Tuberty, who lived there with a couple of her brothers. And I don't think she trusted the brothers because she'd walk into Kilkee with her bicycle, with all her worldly goods hanging off the handlebars of the bicycle on her way in and out of Kilkee back in the early 70s when I used to spend my holidays in John Lynch's house on the, the Carrigahold Road. So by 1977, the Land Commission was in full swing. Um, taking land off on productive and elderly farmers and redistributing it to younger, more productive farmers. And some of you may have read Tom Lynch's book, Booking Passage, in which he talks about his cousin Nora Lynch and Moveen and her battles with the Land Commission. But the Tuberty seemed to have a similar battle because in 1977, Frank Taylor, the local TD at the time, asked the Minister for Agriculture when the Land Commission will take possession of and divide the Patrick Tuberty estate of Kilkasheen, Moveen, County Clare. Kilkasheen is a separate townland, but it's usually considered part of or associated with Moveen. I think Michael Pat Murphy was probably a parliamentary secretary. I don't remember him being a minister. Uh, he said the property has already been vested in the Land Commission, but efforts to obtain possession of the lands have not been successful. Steps are now being taken to obtain a court order for possession it is not possible to state when the lands will be divided. Mr. Taylor was representing a number of farmers concerned and urged the parliamentary secretary to do everything possible to expedite this division. The farmers have been waiting for a long time. A lot of people have been waiting for a long time for things to happen in Kilkasheen. I don't think that subdivision ever happened. And eventually the five Tuberties all died unmarried, probably all intestate without making wills. And the title to the land and to the graveyard was in abeyance then for many years, even more so than it was under the, the convoluted lease from O'Donnell to Tuberty. So at long last, in the last decade or so, um, there's a new registered owner, member of the Tuberty family, and we're grateful for his cooperation. And he has actually sold the majority of the land to another farmer and has uh, split off the part that we need to provide access from the road into the graveyard. When it was used as a graveyard, the funerals used to go through, either through the Tuberty farmyard or across fields. So if it was just an, a newborn baby, you could carry a coffin across the fields and the ditches, but you wouldn't do that with an adult coffin. 
So hopefully this will bring up the present day map. Um, there it is. So you see there's a little, this is from the archaeology.ie website. There's a little red dot to say that there is um, a recorded monument. The Archaeological Survey of Ireland is in the process of providing information on all monuments. And there's very little detail actually on that pop-up other than what you get on, on any graveyard in County Clare. And for some reason the whole field is marked in grey as a graveyard, but in fact it's just a little area around here and possibly stretching across the ditch onto the other side that was the graveyard. Down here you see the site of the original school and there's the current school. And this is the land registry map, um, which requires me to click any number of buttons in order to get it to pop up again. It should have just left it open when I opened it earlier. And we just have to key in the folio number, which is that one. Oh, I didn't even look. This time it came up, it came up with the original one. So there's the same field again. That little area up there is the graveyard. So the plan is to build a pedestrian pathway round by the schoolhouse down to the road and a little car park for three or four or five cars on the main road there so that people can stop and visit the graveyard, see the monument, read about the history and so on. So that will hopefully, before too much longer, be up and running. Um, the planning permission was granted in 2014, originally to the late Father Paddy Culligan, now it's Father Casey's name, representing the parish and it's to provide off-road car parking, a new pedestrian entrance, and fencing uh, site boundaries with all associated site works. Um, why I questioned whether the graveyard was all on the, the Kilkasheen side of that ditch is this is a story I used to hear the late Martin Maloney, originally from Movin, who inherited his mother's farm down in Lachine Crona talking about his father, Tady Maloney, who was born in 1875. When he was a young man, the ditch dividing the townlands of Kilkasheen and Mobian West was broken down and a gang of the locals got together to build it up and Tady told how they were firing up shovelfuls of human bones, skulls, etc. into the new ditch. So everyone knew it was a graveyard, but it was still a field for grazing cattle at the same time. So what does Kilkasheen mean and where did uh, the name come from? There's always a debate when you have a place name in English beginning with Kill, whether that originated with the Irish Kill, C-I-L-L, -L, meaning a church, or Kyle, C-O-I-L-L, -L, meaning a wood. But we all know that in Movine and most parts of the Luped Peninsula, if there are any trees, they don't grow up, they grow horizontally, pointing to the east. And the way the west wind blows them. So I very much doubt there was ever a wood there. Well, they, did, they do tell us the whole country was forested thousands of years ago. So I'm pretty sure it comes from church. And the next thing is who was Cashin? And he's supposed to have been a saint called Cassidan or Cassidanus. There's a great little book, The Story of Inish Kahi um, by Daniel Meskel. If you don't have a copy, I have a photocopy there. You can read the original online. And it tells us about the connection between St. Senan and St. Cassidan or Cassidanus. And this loaded quickly when I tested it earlier. Uh, St. Senan, during his education, placed himself under Cassidanus or Cassidus, a holy man who was a native of a place called Kerry Curraghy between Cork Harbour and Kinsale, but then resided in Urus. Urus is just a peninsula. Um, in the western part of Perkabashkin. Um, and having made much progress here, St. Senan at the instigation of Cassidus moved on to Kilnamana in Ossery and so on. And he's supposed to have actually come back to shortly before he died to Kilkasheen to pay his respects to Cassidanus. The only question about that is where did the D of Cassidanus disappear to in the Irish version of the name uh, Kilkasheen? There's a D in Cassidanus in either Latin or in Cassidus in, in English. And I think it was my late father maybe came up with the theory, we're all the Dalgash in this part of the world, uh, the, the Dalgashian clans. And I'll come, to, come back to that later. First, 
I put this down as anonymous because I have a TypeScript with a description of the site. Um, I just discovered it was written by Farouk the Barra from Kilki. He said, standing in the ground are strong stones in line and too close together to be grave markers. On close examination, we notice they are the outline of the foundations of an old building lying east-west. What really are of interest are the strong stones standing in line. One can't but imagine that here, sometime in the past, was a church or an oratory. The northern and eastern walls were two feet thick, the southern wall more than that, but difficult to ascertain because of elder bushes and briars growing up through it. It is difficult to determine anything about a western wall because of a strong, large, stone-bearing ditch of comparatively recent construction. It might be the ditch that Thady Maloney helped to build around 1900. The width of the structure internally would have been 14 foot 3. A foundation measuring 35 foot 9 in length is discernible on the northern side. So quite clearly there's the foundation of an old church in the middle of the graveyard. And definitely get its name, gets its name from the church of Saint, probably St. Gassadanus. It's not on the record of protected structures, which you can download, which does have protected structures in the Carrigahold area. Battery Bridge, Castle Church, Pier, but no sign of uh, what's left of Cassidy's Church. So there is a pedigree, which I thought was ironic, of the Dalgashan clans, the various surnames that are supposed to be the people descended from Kos, some through his son Koshin, some through his son Oka. And the surnames that descend from Oka are O'Grady. Tuberty, Artigan, etc. So under this theory, if it were correct, the Tuberties had come back to their ancestral lands in Kilkashin. But I think the story about St. Cassadan is better documented and probably a more reliable place name origin. So who's buried there? Or how long has it been a graveyard? Um, Eugene O'Curry or Owen O'Curry, hopefully everyone here is familiar with him. In the mid-80s, uh, the monument at Mangan's Forge in Dunaha was erected to commemorate Eugene O'Curry, who was born nearby. So a lot of people locally did a lot of research on O'Curry's life and times and writing in those days. And one of the things that turned up was in the Ordnance Survey letters. O'Curry worked for the Ordnance Survey, which was mapping Ireland in the 1830s and 1840s. He went around large parts of the country collecting information on the origins of place names and local history. And of course, his best work was done in his own area, which he knew from his childhood. And he wrote this account of another burying ground called Kilkashin in the townland of Kilkashin in this parish, in my art of parish. He says, this was a deserted burying place in the year 1739. But in the ensuing year, when famine and pestilence raged throughout the country, dead human bodies were to be met with by roads and ditches. My grandfather, my Lachlan Gaurav O'Cory, who tenanted at will, being a papist, the tract of land now called Movin, and in which Kilkashin is situated, employed himself, his workmen, his horses and sledges in carrying the victims of the plague from all parts of the neighbouring district and burying them here, so that it has continued ever since to be a burial place, although not a popular one. You probably have lots of questions about what was going on in 1739. Um, there's a wonderful little book about the famine of 1739. Arctic Ireland by David Dixon, a former colleague of mine in a past life in Trinity College in Dublin when I taught there for a while. Uh, what was a sledge? A sledge was a horse-drawn vehicle without wheels. So this is actually a sketch drawn for that book, inspired by O'Curry's story. Here's the grave, the bodies thrown in the Kishon, I suppose you'd call it, carried on this vehicle where you just have the two, um, I can't think of what you call them now, the, the bars of the, the trap, but instead of landing on wheels, they just ran along the ground behind. And that was what the scene might have been like, although there were no upright tombstones in Kilkashin, and in 1739 there were very few upright tombstones anywhere in Ireland, so the artist probably wasn't a good... Didn't spend as much time in graveyards as many of us do. There's an orange light here, which I hope doesn't mean the battery is going to die. 
Uh, O'Curry wrote a more, more detailed account in 1847 to his colleague in the Ordnance Survey, George Peachy, and that's in a book called Ireland from Grattan's Parliament to the Famine, published in 1949. What happened in 1739, 40, 41? A, fr a frost set in severely some days before Christmas 1739. It totally destroyed all the potatoes that had been left in the ground. The frost was so great and of so long continuance that the people were not able to open the ground for the reception of the spring seed, and hence a great dearth of fat food and a destructive mortality ensued. But Curry said, my grandfather was at this time living at Moveen near Kilkee in the west of the county of Clare, and with his brother farmed 1,000 acres. When the famine and mortality were raging in 1741 and 1740. 1740 and 1741, his outhouses and barns were always full of the poor, and his constant business during these two seasons was to take care of those sick and dying creatures and frequently to bury them himself alone. The ordinary burial grounds were not capacious enough to receive the crowds that were dying around him, but there was a long, unfrequented burying ground called Kilkashin on his own lands and about two miles from his own house. So we think he probably lived somewhere near where Murray's house is today, back at the other end of Moveen, which seemed to be the, the biggest house in Moveen for many years. Um, in this place, he got his workmen to dig deep and long trenches in which he buried all that died in his neighborhood, covering them often with his own hands. For such was the terror of the stoutest men that they fled from the presence of the dying and the dead. And not only did he aid in burying those who died in his own neighborhood, but he went with his horses and slide, a slide or a sledge, two different words for that vehicle that, that I showed you in the sketch, um, all over the parish, taking the dead and often putrid bodies out of the deserted houses and out of the ditches and heaping them onto his slide like so many sacks of corn, brought them to his own burying ground and there cast them in as best he could without any assistance and, of course, without coffins. So very similar to the awful accounts we have of what happened in the 1840s. And it's actually estimated the population of Ireland in 1739 was about two and a half million. And maybe 20% of those, maybe the best part of half a million might have lost their lives in that famine, which numerically was less than in the 1840s, but as a proportion of the starting population was even higher. And I think it's widely suspected that the same burial ground might have been used again in the famine of the 1840s, but we've no documentary evidence of that. And this story has been widely known. Archbishop Moran, I didn't know a whole lot about. I'd heard the name. He was born priest of the Dublin Diocese, Bishop of Ossory. But in 1884, he was sent to Sydney. And in 1885, he became a cardinal. And sometime shortly after he arrived in Australia, um, he wrote this article, which appeared in a newspaper in America. The following sketch of one of Ireland's most gifted historians is from the pen of the illustrious Archbishop Moran of Sydney. Eugene O'Curry was one of those earnest men who in our own time have spent their lives in laying deep and broad the foundations on which the solid structure of the genuine history of Ireland may one deep day be raised. He was the son of Owen Moore O'Curry, a struggling farmer of Carrigaholt. Owen Moore had a thorough knowledge um, of Irish manuscripts and so on. He was much respected by all his neighbours, nor was it forgotten that his father, during the terrible famine of 1742, they just got the year out by one or two, proved himself a devoted friend to the sufferers, feeding the starving poor, visiting the fever-stricken families, and when the churchyards could not contain the dead, giving up part of his own farm that it might be consecrated as a cemetery. Slightly different account, because O'Curry's accounts say it was a long-disused cemetery already by 1739. And there's a lot more there on O'Curry, but and Kilkashin is not referred to explicitly, but the graveyard is, was mentioned in American newspapers as early as 1885. Um, and since the Great Famine of the 1840s, there have continued to be burials there. In my own family, my grandmother was Mary or Sis McNamara from Moveen, used to be the next house to the school when I was young. Um, but there's several new houses have gone up along that main road in recent decades. But in fact, that's not the house where she was born. Um, 
my father used to drive down the little side road between the upper and lower Movine roads west of the school and he'd stop at a gate and he'd say, that's the field my mother was born in. She wasn't born in the field. There used to be a house in the field. And her parents married in 1876 and she wasn't born until 1884 and she was their first surviving child. But the story in the family was that my father always heard both of his parents had grandfathers who had fathered 17 children. And we only know of 12 names from my McNamara grandfather's side. So there were five children born between 1876 and 1884 who did not survive. Or as they believed at the time, they were taken by the fairies. And the fairies came from the fairy fort up the road. It's now called Downs's Fort. I think it might have been Maloney's Fort at the time. Only one of those children lived long enough to get a name to be baptised and have birth and death registered. She was Lucy, called after her grandmother, and she had a younger half-sister later, also called Lucy, who married the next-door neighbour, Michael Morrissey. Some of you will know the Morrisseys of Movine. And there's another story that Sean Morrissey, the late Sean Morrissey, Lucy's son, talked I'm assuming, what happened to those five children who were taken by the fairies? They must have been buried somewhere. The obvious place for them to be buried was Killeen for unbaptized babies a few fields away in Kilkasheen. But certainly Sean Morrissey, the, the half-nephew of all those babies, remembered when he was about four or five in about 1918 or 1919, too young to know or be told what was going on. He saw these men coming out of his mother's bedroom with a little box and walking over across the fields towards Kilkasheen. So that was obviously another stillborn baby that was buried in Kilkasheen, one of the Morrisseys. You heard Asumta, God rest her, on the video at the start, those of you who understood the Irish, talking about Mary Curtin, her aunt, who died as a baby, and they live right next to the graveyard, also buried there. And John told us very effectively about his, was it two brothers, John, who buried there, or just one? One. Um, and again, the same thing carried on even into the 1930s. He was Joe, and when he died, the next brother was also called Joe, which doesn't happen anymore, thankfully, because we have so little infant mortality now. Uh, the last adult burial is supposed to have been in 1953. I've heard two different versions. The more reliable one is that it was a man called Thomas Linan. Um, who lived in Movine. Here he is in the 1901 census. He married into a McNamara farm. Was it even a farm? Were they farmers? They were farmers. Um, and so he, he lived with his wife, who was an idiot. Very nice way of describing her. Still managed to produce four children. And in the 1911 census, I didn't notice that bit before. She didn't have any specified illness in 1911 because... She wasn't at home. He was living with his mother-in-law, Johanna, was probably in what they call in West Clare, the Doodla or somewhere. Um, but Thomas continued to live in Movin. Eventually, he moved in to live with his son in Kilkee. Here's his death certificate, which will pop up when I tick the boxes. Um, and Martin Maloney, again, is the source of this great story. Uh, I read out early, or in Corrie, the Boroughs piece, the church building was on an east-west axis, and all the graves and old graveyards in Ireland, as I hope you all know, were also on an east-west axis. Um, Thomas Lenan died the 2nd of January 1953. He was 88. His son, Martin, was present at death. The death certificate in Ireland in those days didn't tell us where people were buried, but we know from local folklore he was buried in Kilkasheen. So they lowered the coffin into the grave, and then somebody looked down and said, you put him down the wrong way. You know what that means? People traditionally were buried facing east, so that when they rose up on the last day, they were facing the rising sun. Um, and that's why all tombstones face east. So if you're trying to read undecipherable tombstones in a graveyard, you have to go out early in the morning when the sun is on the east and the sun is shining on the inscription and the shadow makes it easier to read. But the exception is the priest, because when we rise on the last day, the priest is still supposed to face the congregation. So the priest is supposed to be buried with his head, um, his head to the east and his feet to the 
west. So that when he rises up, he's facing west. So they had put Tom Ladan down the way you'd bury a priest. If you remember Martin Maloney, he'd get this great fits of laughing and he was trying to explain to my father and myself what they meant by burying him the wrong way. And eventually he recovered his composure and said, well, they, they buried him the way you buried the priest with the head facing the wrong way. And they asked the son, what will we do? Do we need to take him up and turn him round? And the son thought for a minute and then turned and said, I'll leave him there, cover him in, he said. So <laughs> that was the end of that. Uh, there's my thing gone. <laughs> there was another man called Carty in the bog, John McCarthy, who died around the same time. I've also been told he's buried in Kilkashin, but I can't find a death certificate for him. But it seems after 1953, it certainly ceased to be used for adult burials, and I'm not even sure were there any infant burials there since 1953. So that's what now, 70 years in a few weeks' time. Um, so the campaign that John Lynch has started many years ago, or maybe he didn't start it, maybe my father started it, is probably inspired by the Public Health Ireland Act, which requires all burial grounds to be fenced and kept in decent order. When the O'Curry commemorations were going on in 1986, my father wrote to the Clare Champion, suggesting cleaning up and fencing in the little graveyard at Kilkashin and erecting a small plaque there. And he gave his own description, having climbed the ditches with his friend Paddy Milani, I think, to go in and see it. He said, this graveyard is situated in a field about 100 yards to the north of Mobian School. It's now almost totally overgrown by grass, weeds, and bushes. It's frequently trampled over by cattle. It contains four flat tombstones and numerous upright, irregularly shaped flags, all without inscription. A patch in the center covered by rocks and bushes is probably the section where Melochton O'Corry interred the famine victims in 1740 but the patch in the center may actually be the foundation of the original Kilkashin. There's also a letter that Paddy Milani wrote, I think it's to the Clare County Express. I'm gonna to have to turn on the torch to read this because I didn't copy it. Paddy said under the title, Dishonoring Movines Famine Victims. I would be much obliged if you would allow me to state my views in a corner of your valuable paper. There's a photograph attached. We are here at the back of Moveen School, at the townland of Kilkashin, at a little graveyard where the famine victims were buried by Owen Moore O'Curry, father of the great Irish scholar Eugene O'Curry. He collected the dead bodies by the sides of the roads here in Moveen with his horse and sleigh. These graves are trampled on by horses and cattle day in and day out as the sun shines and the rain falls. Nobody seems to care. They were our neighbours and our friends, and it is of our concern to put some protection around this little graveyard. There are great books written by learned men about the famine victims, but my humble opinion is that action speaks louder than words. It's about time that those responsible for these places walked decently out in the limelight and protect this consecrated ground. Any of us don't live in an everlasting city. We only pass this way once, and now is our time, while our free will is our own, to stand up and be counted. May they rest in peace. Paddy Milani, Mobin, KT. Uh, when we organised the National Famine Commemoration in 2013, the fact that we had a connection in West Clare to the 1740 famine was one of the points that hopefully convinced the department in Dublin that it should happen here. So this I joined the committee, I think, around 2014, because in May 2015, I set up a Facebook page, which, while we have been trying to acquire the land for the access, has gone sort of dormant recently. The last post I put up was when Father Culligan died a couple of years ago, but hopefully that will become active again when we finally get the, the land holding sorted out. And we reached an agreement with a Clare County Council official in 2017 um, let me turn this light off before I dazzle everyone. The committee solicitor, our solicitor, was to liaise with Clare County Council at the point where the purchased land is to be transferred from the current owner with a view to transferring this land to the council. It is understood your committee has been informed the purchased land cannot be transferred to the committee itself. We may have made a wrong decision. We decided it would hold things up too long if we tried to set up a limited company or a charitable organization or whatever. And in fact, the whole thing has dragged on. We might have been done quicker if we'd done that in those days. 
the Care Champion published an article again with a picture with John and Asumta and Mary Arthur in 2017. That film I saw came out in film I showed you was on the Newt in 2018. Um, the West Clare Municipal District discussed a motion in May 2018 on the graveyard. And since then, unfortunately, we've had illnesses and deaths in our committee. We've had the COVID-19 pandemic. There's been lots of legal queries. The whole thing has been held up, but we've had a letter. I just saw it today um, to say things are finally getting back into order. Um, and Clare County Council will assume ownership of the burial ground and... Uh, I don't want to read the whole thing, but basically we're almost there with an agreement with the county council and the landowner and almost ready to start work. There's been money sitting in the bank to cover the land acquisition costs, but we will be out collecting funds again. And I did bring um, some copies. These are out of date now because they're still in Asumka's name, who was our secretary at the time. So if anyone wants to take a copy of our second letter, which we used to raise funds a few years ago, you're welcome to take them. We also want to make sure we've got the names of everyone we know who's buried in the cemetery. So if you know of anyone that isn't on our list, please let us know. And we hope to put up a little monument and publish a little booklet. And I'd like to pay tribute to all the committee members, unfortunately four, no longer with us. So Sumter died 2019, Paddy Nolan died a month later. Uh, Father Culligan the following year, Marcus Hawk just after him, but John. Mary Arthur, who was at a Coast Guard meeting this evening, myself, Father Casey, and my cousin Michael McNamara are the current Gorgi Gilkashin committees. And we're hoping to finally get this project across the line. Um, sorry that it has taken almost 20 or more years, 30, 36 years, if you go back to the first letter in the Clare Champion to get anything done. So we'll be looking for help, financial and maybe physical, soon with. Uh, building paths and so on. So I hope you learned a little bit and thank you for listening and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. I'm sorry if I rattled on.